hello and welcome to this series of interviews that we are doing with key policymakers, experts, as well as individuals who have made a great contribution in developing what is now one of the most critical relationships on the Indo-Pacific. That is the relationship between India and Australia. Today we have with us a very, very interesting guest, Mr. Vinod Daniel. He holds a number of positions, including Chief Executive Officer and Managing Trustee of the India Vision Institute. His work on heritage prevention has led him to a variety of positions, such as the President of the Board of the Center for Environmental Education and Chief Executive Officer of Ind Heritage and the Chairman of the Board for Aus Heritage. He was a board member of the Australia India Council from 1995 to 2011 and vice chairman of the International Council of Museum Committee for Conservation between 2008 and 2014. Uh, Mr. Daniel has also worked on heritage initiatives in many, many countries in the Indo-Pacific, uh, South and Southeast Asia, US, Canada, and also the Middle East. He was also part of the Australia India Youth Dialogue. He has been awarded the Social Impact Award, the India Australia Business and Community Award in 2023. Uh, welcome, Vinod. It is such a privilege for us to have you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rami, for uh, uh, this generous introduction and and uh, getting to be and uh, getting me to be part of uh, this particular uh, show. Absolutely, Vinod. You know. I think uh, you know the work that you've done is such a great contribution to the series that we are doing. So, you know, to begin with, I want to ask you: You have been involved in international heritage uh, protection projects. What do these projects entail? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, in terms of heritage, um, maybe there are three aspects in 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 the type of projects that happen. Um, one is what we call as, as tangible heritage, which has got two sub-components. Uh, the, the bigger one, which everyone you know, is aware of, is uh, the, the big sites like, like the Taj Mahal. We call them you know, monuments and sites. Uh, and, and there's a lot of international collaboration that happens in terms of preservation of, of these sites you know, across the world. The second component, again, within the tangible realm is um, what we do in terms of collections, you know, objects, and often they become part of museums. And the international collaborations often is in terms of both building museums, as well as a, a range of exhibition exchanges that happen between countries. And there's been a lot of exhibition exchanges between Australia and India in that realm too. And the third one that's getting more and more importance now is what we call as intangible, which includes, you know, the dance and the music and, and a range of other things. And that's, again, something that is at the heart of every society. And again, even in that realm, there's a lot of collaboration that happens internationally and even between Australia and India. Uh, wonderful, like, uh, you know, uh, you put it very precisely into these three segments. Uh, and obviously, you have so much of experience in heritage conservation. Um, what would you say or think is the importance of uh, this sort of conservation or cultural preservations through, let's say, museums in improving interstate ties? Yeah, look, I mean, often the, the big emphasis is on trade there's a little bit of emphasis that happens even you know from a diplomacy perspective but one should never forget the, the the soft power aspect in these ties because sometimes you know trade and other aspects go up and down but these soft power ties are the ones that bind you know countries and societies in the long term and i you know, I, I strongly believe, um, you know, culture, cultural heritage is the core of any society, whether, you know, it's Australia with its strong indigenous heritage or India, which has got probably some of the best, um, you know, cultural heritage, you know, cultures in the world. Uh, I think it, it's quite important. So any ties that happen in this realm is both, you know, um, core in terms of 
of, of the culture, making sure certain aspects of the culture are preserved and continuous, but also give strong links between the, the, the people in both countries uh, in terms of, of, of uh, them appreciating each other's uh, history. Um, I mean, no one's going to come to India anytime without spending at least a few days, you know, appreciating and admiring the rich culture, you know, whether it's it's going to a dance show or going and visiting one of the big monuments. It could be Ajanta or could be Taj Mahal or could be, you know, any of those big sites in the South. You're absolutely right because, you you know, you're, uh, you've spoken about soft power and uh, I think uh, India has uh, such a natural sort of impaction, uh, South Asia, because of the kind of soft power that it has uh, in these areas. But, uh, you know, India and Australia have made some efforts. Where do you think the relationship stands today when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, soft power bringing us closer uh, in terms of, you know, in Australia, uh, like they say, cricket, curry, you know, these have always been there. But how do you think that has advanced? And when it comes to cultural in, uh, integration, what more do you think India and Australia can do? I think, uh, you know, us having this chat, you know, at this time is so appropriate, especially with, uh, you know, the two prime ministers, you know, having just met, um, you know, a couple of days uh, back, and the Australian Prime Minister is still here, so it's it's it's. I think you know we are probably at 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 you know a very important stage in the relationship that's growing, and it'll only grow in future. Um, but any relationship, you know, has got its its peaks and you know its 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 low points. It's just going to you know keep cycling, and that's typically you know how how it works. Uh, but it's also great that that the educational links are getting strengthened. And, you know, I mean, I, I did read in the media about Deakin and even the University of Melbourne, you know, all of them setting up campuses here. And I think ultimately, you know, the core... In and, making... and Australia is uh, recognizing Indian degrees as well. That was a, one of the big announcements. Yeah, 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 I totally agree. And I think the core is going to be how to strengthen the appreciation of each other's cultures and also the people to people links which i think would probably you know be at the same level it doesn't matter what happens in trade what happens in a whole range of other areas so i'm such a strong believer in this aspect of soft power you know the non profit intangible side um, because ultimately when people you know go to any country and come back you know, of course, you know, the business people, some of them might celebrate the big deals that were done, but everybody is going to talk about what they saw, what they enjoyed. And ultimately, you know, that's that's pretty much what, what stays in long-term memory for people, you know, when they visit anywhere. So I think it's quite important, you know, in that realm that, that you know, Australia, especially when it works with India, has this as a very strong element in terms of of the, the relationship in terms of what it, it provides in terms of support. I mean, it's doing so much in, in, in every area. So I would probably think that it's quite important that this keeps being, you know, one of the pillars that they don't forget. Well, I'll have to agree with you completely because I don't think you can have any sort of trust building exercises solely through hard power. Uh, soft power is uh, the binding glue and uh, I think between the India and Australia relationship the people to people connect is so important uh, to bring us closer even though geographically we are distant but um, let me shift the focus a little bit you've done this vastly you know amazing work with heritage preservation and soft power between India and Australia but you also have a non-profit organization called the India Vision Institute. Um, how do you manage both these very, you know, different sort of areas? Uh, what did you, how did you decide to shift the focus from heritage preservation towards uh, vision care in India? Yeah. Look, I mean, I think I still focus quite a bit on heritage preservation. 
uh, on heritage collaboration, uh, on, on heritage projects, you know, across the globe, um, especially between, you know, Australia and India, that, that's a very, very important element. Um, but I also wanted to, to do something in the social realm. I'm, I'm originally from, from Chennai. I did my studies here in India. I went to IIT Delhi and then I went off to the US and then settled in Australia in the mid 90s. So, you know, I, I do have a strong heart for both countries and I, you know, I was quite keen to do something in the social realm. So it just happened that when I was in one of the boards um, uh, in, in, in Australia within foreign affairs, within the board of the Australia India Council, one of my colleagues was so passionate about I care globally, and his name was Professor Brian Holden. So he was, you know, part of the board, a good friend, a good colleague, sadly he passed away, you know, a few years back. But he used to come to India quite regularly. And, you know, his passion was just on one issue. He said, look, uh, Vinod, you know, there is a strong need for people to have access to a pair of spectacles. And I thought, look, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a simple one, but it's it's quite profound from a perspective that, you know, a pair of spectacles is transformational for many people. Um, for kids, it means you know they can probably see the board, study well, study, and at least pass exams and graduate. So six to seven percent of kids can't see well, can't probably see the board clearly. And that's a big issue, especially among the urban poor and the rural population. For adults, as you get older, all of us need reading glasses. Some have distance vision issues. Um, and, and what happens as you get older or if you have distance vision issues, your productivity is not that great because you're struggling to perform certain manual jobs. I mean, you can imagine a tailor in a small town who after you know, 40, 45 without reading glasses, where the light levels are low, you know, how much struggle they would have even to be productive. So often they say the productivity is uh, is decreased probably as much as 25%, which means your income earning potential goes down by about the same amount. And that can drive a lot of people down to poverty. So it's, it's the transformational impact of just, you know, having a pair of classes. So we, you know, focus just on that one single issue. And so far, you know, as part of this, local trust that we have established in India about a decade ago, we covered close to 900,000 people in terms of the outreach efforts. And, and in addition, there's a lot of awareness campaigns and a whole range of other things happen. So this one is, is purely from the, 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 the heart in terms of wanting to do something, you know, in the social realm in India. So I, I just kind of juggle both, but it's been a very enjoyable uh, journey. Well, with uh, the kind of people that, uh, the amount of people, you said uh, 900,000? Yes, yeah. So far, that's what we've done. And we are now averaging about 300,000 screenings every year. That's incredible, you know. So if that's the kind of impact that you've had, then uh, uh, surely your institute seems to be, you know, really at the right place. Um, but tell me more about, you have an institute as well, it's called the India Vision Institute. Um, yes. Uh, tell me more about that. Yeah, so that's a um, Indian registered non-profit trust. So with a sole objective to assist underprivileged get access to a pair of spectacles. So very much in the primary IK sector. So we work across India. We work in about 22 states. Uh, on on one issue, which is, you know, how do we make sure we enable people, everyone to have access to a pair of spectacles. And also we help a little bit in the awareness creation because many people are not aware that, that all they need is a pair of spectacles. They don't need to struggle with eyesight. A lot of people think I'm just old, so I can't see well. They don't realize all they need is a pair of glasses. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's quite life-changing and transformational. A lot of younger people, um, probably uh, they've been born with probably a, a little bit of you know bad eyesight. They struggle through school. They never realize that that vision uh, could be better. So the minute you screen, you give them a pair of glasses, all of a sudden they see the world in a whole different light. 
uh, right? I mean, they can see the board, they can see so many things because it's, it's a big issue. Really. For them. Yeah. Yeah, but it's a big issue which which is becoming a bigger issue in India. So India probably has got you know among children uh, probably uh, the um, the, the uh, myopia is, is is at about six to seven percent, which is growing, right? And you look at countries like China and and other parts, it's, it's quite high. It could be you know more than 40, 50 percent, and countries like Singapore, it could be as high as seventy percent. So, wow. you know, I mean, you would see probably every second child wearing a pair of glasses in Singapore. So, you know, eventually there is um, a, a big um, issue with myopia growing. But I guess we are slowly trying to deal with this issue. And I mean, of course, we are not the only charitable organization working in this area. There are lots of other excellent organizations working. But it's important that, that more players, you know, contribute towards this. So from your experience, what have you found? What are the integral reasons for this myopia growing? See, it's um, probably, see, um, in terms of prevalence, based on our statistics, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, about 6 to 7%, and maybe the rural population might have a slightly lesser prevalence than the urban population. But one would need to just wait for a bit longer to get better statistics on what the impact of COVID and other things have been, where there's been a great push towards online tools, right from students probably, you know, studying using their little mobile phones. Uh, and I mean, of course, it's already, you know, in the bigger cities, kids spend a lot more time on computer games and, and, and you know, uh, smartphones and, and, and being indoors, um, so I, I think it's it's an issue. Definitely, um, you know, more exposure to sunlight is good, uh, and 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 uh, but it's it's pretty hard to say what the growth has been. It might take a bit longer, but we are definitely seeing a trend in that direction, and and that's been flagged by many experts to 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 keep a watch on. I understand. Um... But, you know, as we come closer to the end of this interview, though, I have so many questions to ask you of the wonderful work that you're doing. Um, I'm really interested to know what is, uh, you know, what is one of the projects that you have done uh, in heritage protection that uh, we might be aware of? Yeah, look, I mean, in heritage protection, um... I mean, recently or two weeks back, we signed an MOU with uh, with the PD Corps in in uh, Jaipur. Um, so that's 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 a fifty percent owned entity uh, uh, by the Rajasthan government, and this one would be you know Australian experts collaborating with um, with some local partners in helping with the city of Jaipur. So city of Jaipur is a world heritage site. So prior to this, we worked on 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 some 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 excellent projects across the country, right from um, a, a a small home that was the home of uh, one of the the the, the, the well known previous leaders, uh, Mr. Kamaraj, down in deep south Virudhunagar. So in terms of working out a conservation management plan for that home, we also had some people. Um, you know, some some textile conservators who spend a lot of time, um, you know, who came all the way from from Australia and spend time helping with uh, preserving the the remnants of the kurta pajama that uh, that uh, Rajiv wore uh, after the Sri Perumbuthur blast. So that was you know quite uh, a, a touching. Uh, uh, you know, experience. So you know, I was quite involved with with, with that project. And also to preserve the sari that Mrs. Gandhi wore when she was assassinated. Uh, then we've been to Shantri Ketan to to provide some assistance for um, the the Tagore Museum out there. We have worked uh, closely uh, also in in uh, in uh, helping out a little bit with the Ambedkar collections at the museum in Chicholi. So it's it's been you know quite quite vast. We continue to work closely with uh, with all the national collecting institutions, the Ministry of Culture. Whenever they they host major events, you know we provide uh, some support or or uh, 
or you know help in a very well stage oh that's good to know so uh, let me come to my final question which is your iabca award uh, in 2023 your social impact award was a great recognition for the prolific work that you've done uh, can you uh, envision uh, and obviously you've done uh, work with uh, the culture ministry and other such organizations but can you uh, envision a scope of India and Australia collaboration in the intersection of heritage culture protection as well as a social impact sector on a much larger scale? Yeah, I think there is a lot of discussions and work that happens between the two countries on, you know, culture, culture, you know, heritage. Of course, uh, you know, there are lots of performing art groups that go back and forth to both places, you know, from the intangible realm. When it comes to tangible aspect, there are several exhibition exchanges that have happened and that will continue to happen, you know, between the major museums there and here. I think, you know, that that part would only be growing because I think the museum movement in India is actually getting stronger. Uh, I think it's 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 a great vision of uh, the Indian government that they are uh, you know supporting more museum developments. You know I think right from I had the privilege of visiting uh, Vadnagar um, a, a week back and I saw you know the, the 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 new museum coming up there. There's there's a whole range of new museums you know right from the Prime Minister's Museum and you know etc cetera, etc cetera, that that's happening. I think that also would would provide more basis for for one is, um, you know, for people to come there and learn a bit more about each other's cultures. I mean, Australia is very strong already in the museum side. And I think India will be very strong very soon in terms of, uh, you know, those aspects, but also provide a platform for exhibition exchanges to happen in a bigger way where each other's cultures can be brought to, you know, the other country and for more people to appreciate. It's not possible for, you know, many people to travel to the other country. But if you can bring some of the cultures, you know, down here, I think, you know, that's probably the best mechanism, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, how more people can can enjoy and appreciate, uh, you know, each other's culture. You know, you're absolutely right, because I would love to go to an exhibition, you know, of, uh, you know, maybe Australian heritage, Aboriginal heritage, or even the modern culture, you know, and I think that would be great for our diplomatic relations. And uh, when you mention uh, museums developing in India, uh, I recently went to Dandi as well. And uh, the museum that's come up on that land, which was basically waste land because it was salt land, is incredible. And uh, it's completely solar powered. But yes, India has some way to go. And I'm sure with the growing relationship between India and Australia, this hopefully is on the agenda. Thank you so much, Vinod, for taking out the time and being with us and being a part of the, the series that we are doing, which really brings uh, key people like yourselves, experts like yourselves to the forefront and uh, helps us learn more about the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Rami, for this uh opportunity and your your generous time thank you